So the, this uh, Sixth Patriarch, he never studied many books, but he was, we say, self-enlightened. He was enlightened from a very young age. He's heard somebody chanting Diamond Sutra when he was like 16 or 15 years old, and he was enlightened. And he had some deep attainment, some deep experience, where he understood like the Buddhas of the past and understood his own future also, and the future of his disciples. And then he said, please take your proper seats. I want to say goodbye. <laughs> so this is here, you see, he was very much aware that he was going to soon leave this world. He said, I want to say goodbye. Then again, somebody asked him, Master, can you tell us how to teach deluded people of future generations so that they may realize their true nature? This is a typical question that the disciple will ask the master just before he's to pass away. How do we teach people of future generations? And he goes, then he answers by saying, listen carefully, if deluded people understand ordinary sentient beings, then that is Buddha nature. Oh, so if deluded people understand what is sentient beings, then that is Buddha nature. So what is sentient beings? So to teach Buddha nature, he pointed to the opposite, which is sentient beings. So we have to find out what is a sentient being to understand what is a Buddha nature. So he goes on, he says, let me teach you how to see the sentient beings in your own mind and thereby see the Buddha nature in yourself. Knowing Buddha means nothing else than knowing sentient beings. <laughs> See, Buddha and sentient beings are opposite. Sentient beings, Buddha. So if you want to understand Buddha nature, you must also you must know sentient beings. Because it's the latter who ignore that they are Buddhas in potentiality, whereas a Buddha sees no difference between himself and other beings. So if you're already a Buddha, you're not going to ask this question about how to realize your true nature. But if you're a sentient being, you'll ask this question about how to realize your true nature. <laughs> okay, that's a point there. So, if you attain your true nature, then sentient beings are Buddha. But if your true nature is diluted, then Buddha is an ordinary sentient being. If we see the equality of Buddha and sentient beings, then that, that it should say, that view is Buddha. That view is Buddha. So, originally, Buddha and sentient beings are equal. If we see that they are equal, that view, that way of seeing things, we call that Buddha. That name, so Buddha is also just a name. Sentient beings just a name. If we truly perceive that the whole world is equality, everything's equality, no class distinction, everything's equal, then that view is the correct Buddha nature view. He goes on, he says, if, if the mind is evil, then even a Buddha is an ordinary being. So if you have an evil mind, if you have an evil mind, you want to hurt people, you want to really, even, even the Buddha up here, the Buddha is not a Buddha. The Buddha is just another sentient being. This is why in the time of Shakyamuni Buddha's life, there were people who were jealous of him and hated him and wanted to kill him and even tried to, to, to hurt him because their minds were tainted. Their mind was evil, so they saw the Buddha. Uh, they didn't see the true Buddha only. When your mind is crooked and wicked, you are an ordinary being with Buddha hidden within you. However, if you have even one straightforward thought, at that moment, ascension being becomes Buddha. So even though you may have many wicked and evil thoughts and may think about doing many horrible things, all it takes is one very clear, straight thought and again, sentient being becomes a Buddha. So one thought in one moment is very important. One thought in one moment makes you either a sentient being or a Buddha. That's the point here. Within our mind is Buddha. This mind is the true Buddha. If Buddha doesn't exist in our mind, where can we find the true Buddha? Do not doubt that Buddha is within your mind, apart from which nothing can exist. And he goes on to explain about this. And he has this, a real Buddha of the true nature, this poem. 
and I'm not going to go through that right now. There's so many, many different teachings here. But basically, same point. If you have one straight and clear thought, just this mind is the Buddha. Just this mind is the Buddha. Then finally he says, all of you should take good care of yourselves after I pass away. Don't follow the worldly ways of grief, sadness, or crying. Don't accept condolences or wear the clothes of mourning. If you do these things, you are not my students. This is not the correct dharma. You should all understand your original mind and see into your original nature, which is not moving or quiet, doesn't appear or disappear, doesn't come or go, has neither affirmation nor denial, doesn't stay or depart. So he didn't want any of his students to cry for him or to make ceremonies for him or to accept condolences you know, condolences and to wear clothes that look like they're sad. He didn't like any of that. Nothing of it, none of that. And this is a it when the Sixth Patriarch was alive, this is became the kind of the Zen tradition. But later of course this changed again. The Sixth Patriarch already understood where he was going to. He already understood exactly where he going and what would happen after he died. So he's not sad. And he told his disciples, don't be sad. I already know where I'm going. He even predicted five years later, somebody would come and cut off his head. And it happened. And the, do you know who came and cut off his head? You are all Korean, you don't know? <laughs> it was a Korean monk. <laughs> yeah. It's in the book here. <laughs> So he said, don't be sad, don't do anything like that. Then uh, uh, the sixth patriarch, he sat serenely until around midnight. He sat until midnight. First he offered them another poem, completely not moving. One practices no virtue without hindrance. No sins are committed. Completely still, one lets go of seeing and hearing. Equinem, equinem, equinemas. Aquinamus, the mind attaches to nothing. So his poem, this was his nirvana poem, maybe. Completely not moving, one practices no virtue. Without hindrance, no sins are committed. So without any uh, hindrance, we don't have any sins. The mind attaches to nothing. Here you see the essence of his teaching. The mind attaches to nothing. The last line Equanimous? How do you say that? Equanimous? Difficult word. The mind attaches to nothing. Okay. This is the essence of his teaching. It's also essence of the Diamond Sutra. So then the six patriarchs sat very quietly, serenely until around midnight, and suddenly called to his disciples, I'm leaving now. And then he silently passed away. Then it said, a uh, uh, very extraordinary fragrance filled the room, and outside a rainbow, a lunar rainbow form, joining earth and sky, turning the whole landscape white. And all the animals and birds of the forest cried mournfully. Well, we don't, this is all, you know, you hear this kind of thing about many masters who die, and we, we don't really know. But this is, uh, this is probably true, because in those days, people's minds were very simple, very pure. So they could observe these things. Nowadays, our minds are sort of clouded with many thoughts and wondering what we will do. And we don't observe these things. Even they happen, we don't observe them. So then you can see after he passed away, government officials from Guangzhou, Shaozhou, and Jingzhou, they began to argue about the final resting of the patriarch, each wanting the remains for their district. They each wanted something of his remains to put on their, the, the land where the government is. And so they're arguing, arguing. Of course, this is not what the patriarch would have <laughs> wanted them to do. And finally, the patriarch's disciples, along with other monks and laymen, they also took part in the dispute. Finally, they could not settle the dispute. so. They decided to pray to the patriarch and burn incense, allowing the incense smoke to indicate the direction of the place which he himself would choose. And the smoke drifted directly towards Cao Qi. So the reliquary 
containing the patriarch's body together with his robe and bow were returned there on the 13th day of the month. Chaochi, by the way, is a Chogi mountain uh, in the south of China. Uh, it's where Namwasa, near Namwasa Temple. And then it said that um, they, in the next year, they took the patriarch's body and they plastered it with incense paste. This was the Chinese tradition was to kind of take the body and, and like cover it with incense so it would be preserved. Unlike what we do nowadays, monks are cremated, usually within five days or seven days after they die. But in those days in China, especially for a very holy and great monk, they tried to keep the body like a mummy. They would coat it like a mummy, like a, a mira. You know, they would coat it. And then uh, they, would, they would continue to worship it like a, like a kind of like a, a kind of a, you know, a Buddha and put it on the altar. And that's what happened with the six patriarchs. You can still see the six patriarchs' mummif mummified body, small body. It's got very small since all the moisture came out. You can still see it at Namwa Temple in China. But there's something very strange, because even though you can still see the six patriarchs' body at Namwa Temple today in China, if you go to China, uh, if you go to uh, Hong Kong the, or Guangzhou, from Guangzhou, it's about five hours north. There's a temple, uh, which I visited several times, called Namwa Temple. And Namwa Temple, on the altar, in one of the back, uh, behind the Poptang, there's the big Poptang, and behind the Poptang, there's another hall, and it says Hall of the Six Patriarch. And you can see this body, it's very dark. It's all covered with like, like lacquer, uh, like a mummy, you can see. He's sitting, he's just sitting, has the casa on, and he's sitting there. But there's something a little funny about that, because when we look, uh, well, we'll get to that afterwards. I'll talk to you about that after. But let's finish here. It says uh, that remembering the patriarch's predict prediction that his head would be taken away, they securely wrapped his neck with iron sheets and lacquered cloth before placing it in the stupa. Suddenly a white light shone from within the stupa, shining straight up into the sky, and it shined brightly for three days. This was duly reported to the emperor by the officials of Shaozhou district. By imperial order, memorial tablets were erected recording the patriarch's life. And then we see here that the patriarch inherited the robe when he was 24, but he didn't become a monk. He was not ordained until he was 39 years old. He was not ordained until he was 39, and he lived for 76 years. He taught for 37 years for the benefit of all sentient beings, transmitted the Dharma to 43 disciples, and many attained enlightenment, and many uh, rose above the ordinary under his direction. And finally, they took the robe that he got from Bodhidharma, the robe and the bowl, from the emperor and a statue and other personal articles were put in charge of the keeper of the pagoda to be kept permanently at Paolin Temple for the protection of the monastery. And the Sutra of the Patriarch was printed and distributed widely so the teaching and the intent of the school, Southern School, could be known. This was done so that Buddhism could flourish and for the benefit of all sentient beings. So if you read so far, you see that everything was basically uh, about his life and his passing into nirvana is all summarized here. But if you turn to the next page, aha, there's another chapter in this story that appears. The appendix by Ling Tao, the stupa, key, stupa keeper. And it turns out that at midnight of the third day of the eighth moon of the year of Renju, Noises similar to those made by the dragging of an iron chain were heard within the stupa in which the patriarch's remains were shrined. Awakened by the alarm, the bhikkhu saw a man in mourning run out of the pagoda. Subsequently, they discovered that damage had been done to the patriarch's neck. So 
somebody tried to take his head. And it turned out that this man who tried to take his head had received 2,000 cash from a Korean bhikkhu, a Korean monk named Jin Da Bei, who ordered him to steal the patriarch's head to be taken back to Korea for veneration. Now, this is a very kind of odd thing. Why would somebody want to steal the patriarch's head? Maybe they thought this head was so holy that even after he passed on, that this head would, would have some holy wisdom. So they were going to take it back to Korea from China. But it's kind of, it's kind of like to steal somebody's head. It's kind of a funny thing. But now what's interesting here is that even though this man was caught and he was um, taken to Shaozhou for trial, uh, and they said according to the law of the state, he should get the death sentence. But as mercy is the keynote of Buddhism, which teaches that when his relatives and enemies, enemies should be treated alike, uh, the offender may be pardoned. So they pardoned him out of compassion for him. They pardoned him. And the governor was very impressed. But they don't say here what actually happened to the head. Okay, but it says here later, we look, it says that it doesn't say that the head was taken. Okay, but in Korea, there's a temple called Sangesa Temple in the south near Chirisan. In Chirisan, actually, Sangesa Temple. And if you go to Sangesa Temple, it very uh, emphatically says that the six patriarchs' head was brought there from China. And that it is underneath the pagoda at Sangesa Temple is the head of the six patriarch. So this is interesting because if the six patriarch head really did come to Sangesa Temple, then whose head? is on the body that's the sixth patriarch now in China. How can there be two heads? So this is a, a very uh, interesting uh, point. So maybe the head that came to Korea was a different head. Or maybe uh, they got the right head and the Chinese have a different body. Well, the one that you see in China is real. Because you can see it. It's actually out on the altar. It's like, like sitting where you can see it. You can see the head. But the one in Korea, you can't see the head, so you don't know if it's real. But there is a record in Sangesa Temple says that the head of Sixth Patriarch was under the pagoda. There's a pagoda in Sangesa Temple and a, a room that says Six Patriarch's head of Sixth Patriarch room. If you have chance. You can go to Sangisa Temple, and that place is considered a holy place. There are monks always sitting meditation around there. So either there, one of them is, is false, or which is the true head, or maybe he had two heads. <laughs> or maybe uh, you're watching my head. So this is an interesting, uh, this is an interesting kind of final not final, but interesting, like, kind of happening after the sixth patriarch passed away. So his uh, dharma was so, uh, was so influential. He had so much influence over his disciples that even disciples from other, even people from other countries wanted to take his head years after he died. That's how much influence he had. And uh, his, uh, uh, he left the record of his dharma in this book, which is... Uh, quite uh, detailed of all the conversations he had with many different monks, the Dharma combat, all the different like, conversations he had. It's uh, really incredible that it was all recorded in such detail. And nowadays we have tape recorders, but they didn't have that in those days. So all the, so all the poems, of course, all these were written in Chinese, but not by him. Uh, it's it's uh, well known that the Sixth Patriarch didn't read Chinese. So he must have had all his disciples write down everything that was happening around him. 
all the things that were happening around him. Uh, and it's true that there were monks from Korea who came to China at that time to uh, pay respect to Hui Neng, the sixth patriarch, and to, uh, to learn from him. And uh, of course, also there was that monk who tried to get his head by paying, the, paying money to have somebody try to steal the head. We don't know about the, finally, where is the head? Which one is the true head? The one in Korea or the one in China? This is a, a, for you to answer, OK? <laughs> OK, any other question? Any question you have? No question? So everybody found the head? <laughs> what happened to the robe, the robe and the bowl? So the robe and the bowl of the sixth Pedro, after the sixth Pedro, because there were so many people who wanted to possess these. They were no longer, he no longer handed them down, and they are now at Namwa Temple. If you go to Namwa Temple, you can see them. The robe is actually gold colored, and it's on display in a box in this hall where the six spirits, what they say, true body, where his true body, his mummified body, is on the altar. So you, if you go to Namwa Temple, it's actually, it's the Chinese word is Namwa Sanza, Na, Namwa Zen Temple. If you go there, you can see six patriarchs, true body, and you can see this, uh, the robe th that he was given. But we don't know whether that is the actual robe, because when you look in this uh, book, it says that all those things were put in the stupa, in the pagoda. And when we're faced with people who only want to argue and who want to convince us that their view is right regardless, then we put our palms together, smile, and that's uh, enough. We put our palms together, smile, then we don't have to say anymore. This is a way of showing that we have our way to go, you have your way to go. You eat your food, I eat my food, in other words. See, this is a problem now. Actually, this is a problem uh, because in today's world, it's much more complicated and much more people in today's world. And every religion thinks we are the right religion and only our way is true. So why do you think we have difficulty in Korea today? Because in Korea also, People think, my religion is the right one. Other religion is not so good. My religion is superior. So the old way that uh, wise people, uh, Buddhists, were answer with, if somebody talks like that and argue like that, you must believe in my way, only my way is the right way. You only. And you can get up and you can leave. <laughs> but uh, in uh, practical application, this is sometimes difficult in today's world because today's world people uh, are, tend to be very uh, egoistic and uh, very like uh, strongly say only this well, only one way and the, the you know the not only the Christians but also there are other groups that are doing that that are there are also uh, some kind of a Buddhist uh, cults that say there is only one way this is a mean they are very narrow. This is only understand the one way. This is a, uh, we say, uh, this is a situation in today's world. And many people only understand the one narrow way. And some people are very convinced <coughs> that uh, everything is empty and that empty is a one. That's also a mistake. So, uh, in this uh, situation, uh, the older, the, like the Sixth Patriarch teaching is, we can just, and we can do our move on. Okay? Any other question? I have a question. Yeah. The page two, uh, 254, mm -hmm. 10.16. 10 Uh, yes. If one obtains the summary of one form and one attention, it is like a seed planted in the fertile soil. 
Is it means that the fact of telling the summary and the practice to put up Well, you see here, he talks about before in the 10.15, he talks about something he calls um, those who wish to attain the all knowing of a Buddha should know the one form samadhi and one action samadhi. In all situations, free yourself from attachments to forms. Do not give rise to desire or anger. So, what is this one form samadhi? One action samadhi? Concentration. Uh, yeah, that's not a complete concentration, not only concentration, but it means that you are not attached to any form. You and the form is one. And the action, your action and your is like a, a completely doing it. That's what he's talking about. In all situations, free yourself from attachments to form. Do not give rise to desire, anger. Do not, don't cling or be indifferent. Be calm and serene, humble and accommodating, simple and dispassionate. The name for this is one form samadhi. So this is only like name, one form samadhi. We say, nowadays in our Zen school, we say one mind. <coughs> Six patriarchs said one form samadhi, but we say one mind. Completely become one mind with something. Completely, when you're doing something, when you're drinking tea, just the drinking tea. When you're painting a drawing, just painting drawing. This is a one samadhi action. Okay? But this is a name, he said. One form samadhi, on all occasions, whether we are standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, one should keep a straightforward mind. If you keep a not moving practice mind, truly, you have arrived at the pure land. This is the one action samadhi. So key point is here, if you keep a not moving practice mind. So if your mind is not moving, if your mind is really not moving, then you arrived at the pure land, then every action you do is like samadhi. Okay? And sometimes, uh, uh, we can see this uh, demonstrated for us when we watch somebody uh, do some kind of dance and they do it very well chor choreographed dance and they just move just move but you can see they're not moving uh, without they're not moving they're moving completely in touch they're completely one mind with their moving so it's not really moving Okay? Other question? Okay, so everybody now already has a chance to uh, hear this talk about the Six Patriarchs Platform Sutra, and I hope that you have a, a get, I hope that you gained a, uh, some real uh, insight from this. This is a uh, uh, probably one of the greatest uh, texts and greatest uh, kind of teachings that we have in the Zen tradition that's written down. So I hope that you can uh, really get some uh, inspiration and get some value from this uh, teaching. Okay? All right. Okay, you're welcome. That's